Calispera Centrofia, thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you for this invitation to come to your conference and giving me some time to say a few words today. And I'm very impressed with all the different campaigns, causes, unions, and community organizations that you've invited in to describe how they are changing things, how they're campaigning, and how they're changing people's minds. Because too often political parties think that um, the silo they occupied is clear and bright and beautiful, and anybody outside is a nuisance. They just need to hear what we're sending out. You need to hear the messages coming in as well. In fact, we don't need silos. We need big open spaces, which we all occupy together. <laughs> and to me, it's fascinating to be here in Athens, to be in Greece again. And the role played by some people from Britain and many other countries around the world in the heroic struggle for Greek independence from the Ottoman is something that I find fascinating to read. And there was no greater supporter of Greek independence than uh, Lord Byron. Lord Byron was an eccentric. He alternated between being mega rich and desperately poor because he wasn't very good at managing money. And um, he uh, wrote the most brilliant poetry. But what isn't always known is that the only time he ever spoke in the House of Lords, which is the, was then the completely hereditary upper chamber of the British parliamentary system, he spoke up in support of a very desperate group of workers in Nottingham who were smashing up machines because the machines were being introduced by the employers and rendering a lot of workers unemployed because the machines took away the jobs of the workers. They were called the Luddites because they were allegedly standing in the way of progress. The Luddites were people defending their community, their jobs, and their living standards, and they wanted a share in the wealth. They didn't want to be driven into further poverty and unemployment, and Lord Byron very bravely spoke up in their support. He finally died in Greece as part of your campaign for your independence. And he wrote much poetry, but one line I really like, he says, um, Adversity is the first path to truth. Think about it. It's a very interesting thought he had there. And your strategies and campaigns and the way you defeated the Nazi occupation in the Second World War, the civil war that followed, and then the desperate time of the colonels in charge in Greece. And then the assault on your public services and your living standards, the assault on so much in Greece, this time carried out by the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which then forced the privatization of so much of your public services. Our battles are social, our battles are economic, our battles are also an understanding of history. Socialism is the idea and the ideal by which we all live. And I think there are four points I'd make about socialism, if I may. Peace, justice, humanity, and our relationship to the natural world. Peace is not just the absence of war, but peace is something we have to always work for and strive for. What's happening now in the Ukraine is wrong by any stretch of the imagination under any way you care to measure it. The invasion is wrong, the occupation is wrong, the bombing is wrong, the killing is wrong, and the destruction of so much life of people in the Ukraine. There can be no defense for it whatsoever. The statement we put forward today from the Progressive International, which I'm honored to be a member of the Council of, made that very clear. All wars have to end at some point. All wars end with some kind of conference, negotiation, or process. Why, oh why, oh why, did the UN take so long to even call for a ceasefire? 
Why have so many of the world's leaders been using the language of war and aggression when they should be using the language of demanding now a ceasefire to stop the killing and give some hope to the people of Ukraine and to the Russian soldiers that are also dying there? Because the longer it goes on, the more the deaths, the more the destruction, the more the hatred that would follow, and the economic and environmental consequences of this war go on. Food prices rising, many across North Africa and the Middle East will be desperately hungry later this year when the wheat supplies don't arrive from Russia and the Ukraine to make their bread. And the prices will go up all over the world as a result of it. It needs serious intervention to bring about a ceasefire and bring about peace for the people of the Ukraine. There are many other wars going on, sadly. There are more than 40 different conflicts going on at the present time. Think of the decades of war in Yemen the killing that's gone on in Yemen and the destruction of life that's gone on there. The war in Syria, the war in Libya, the terrible conflict in Iraq. All of these conflicts are fueled by the arms trade and they all create massive numbers of victims. Occupation of one country by another creates occupation. Great Irish writer James Connolly, great socialist, said, a one country that occupies another cannot itself be free. And he was talking about Br Britain and Ireland. But the consequences of that occupation are devastating for people. And today, we mourn the death of Shireen Abu Agle, a journalist from Al Jazeera, killed, shot in the head, by Israeli occupying forces on the West Bank, where she was reporting on the lives of Palestinian people. She follows, sadly, many others that have been killed as a result of that occupation. And today, even at her funeral, the Israeli armed forces managed to disrupt the funeral and even the coffin fell to the ground as a result of it. Today, our sympathies, our solidarity with her and her family, but also with the Palestinian people. The occupation must end. It cannot go on. It is not sustainable. So it's our solidarity with the victims of war. But when the fighting stops, and the occupying forces have withdrawn, that is never the end of the story. Afghanistan, the occupation started in 2001, so far as the West were concerned. We formed the Stop the War Coalition in Britain in opposition to the occupation of Afghanistan, not Iraq, Afghanistan, which came before. 20 years later, 21 years later, they're withdrawn. The troops leave, and Afghanistan is now the most hungry, the most poorest, and the most repressive regime anywhere in the world. Hardly a testament to benign liberal intervention. It's been an absolute disaster as Afghan people try to seek safety somewhere else in the world in order to get away from it. It's always the world's poorest people in the poorest places that suffer as a result of war. Those that fled from Iraq and from many other conflicts around the world, they're victims of war. There are now 70 million people in the world who are refugees. That's more than the population of the United Kingdom. Think of it, 70 million people, refugees, ordinary people, trying to survive in a cruel and horrible world, trying to make their way and survive in the world. 
And it's the poorest countries that often carry the greatest demand for refugees. There's a million Rohingya people in Bangladesh at the present time. There are huge numbers in African countries neighboring each other, as well as the huge numbers in camps in Libya and elsewhere. And there are then those that try to get to a place of safety. Those that die crossing the Mediterranean, those that die trying to get across the channel from France to Britain, and those that are put into effectively prison camps when they arrive in different countries, as in the case of Europe, Frontex operates pushback. And I was very impressed with the speech made earlier about the legal action and other work being undertaken. We, part of the left, part of the socialist movement around the world, should never, ever indulge in the horrible xenophobic rhetoric against refugees. They are human beings just like you, just like me, trying to survive in this world. They need the hand of friendship and support, not of condemnation and racism and violence against them. And that means that I absolutely support and welcome Ukrainian refugees who have arrived in my country and other countries, and I admire the support that's been given to them and the popular outpouring to try and help and sustain them. And indeed, I was talking to Ukrainian refugees last week in my own community in North London. But there are other refugees that don't get the right to work, don't get that kind of welcome, and end up living in desperation and poverty. We need decent, fair, reasonable treatment for all refugees, be they, be they Ukraine, Afghanistan, Yemen, Libya, Syria, or anywhere else in the world. And we also need, as Yanis has pointed out, in international politics, not just the immediate demand of the um, ceasefire in Ukraine, but also a different direction in our international thinking and strategy. Defense spending all around the world is going up. The US has just passed the biggest ever defense budget. NATO member states are being encouraged to go to 2% and above of their gross national income as part of defense expenditure. And when a conflict goes on, the arms manufacturers pressurize their government to spend more and buy more. And it doesn't matter what country you're in, they all do it. They do it in Russia, they do it in Europe, they do it in the USA. They all pressurize for it. The arms trade then becomes a pressure of itself for conflicts and wars. And so what we were talking about this morning at the conference that we did here in Athens was about looking to a future where you wind down the idea that military alliances bring peace and you bring forward the idea that you cooperate together and you deal with the social, economic and environmental problems that people face. And this summer there's going to be a, a conference, very important conference in Vienna of the start of the process to try and give real life to the global ban on nuclear weapons treaty which has majority support in the UN General Assembly. The idea being that we get rid of nuclear weapons once and for all. There, there are no defense, they're only the ultimate weapon of mass destruction and if ever used, millions will die on the first weapon, millions more on the second. We won't be able to count after that because we won't be around to know about it. We have to get rid of nuclear weapons altogether. <laughs> the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, showed us just how unjust and unequal this world is. When the pandemic started, the World Health Organization quite rightly said they wanted universal free access to health care for everyone around the world. A very small number of countries actually have universal free access to health care. That pandemic exposed the poverty and inequality on this planet, exposed the way in which the poorest people are most susceptible to contagious diseases, and also exposed the good and the bad of humanity. The good were mutual aid groups, we call them in my country, others, where citizens come together 
to support each other, support those that are going through difficulties and help people going through a mental health crisis and set up food banks and food cooperatives to make sure people got through. And they were very effective. And as a whole generation, the mutual aid generation that will never forget that sense of solidarity that came from it. But the bad, the other side of it, was the grotesque profits made by big pharmaceutical companies as they overcharged for vaccine research, which was paid for by the public purse in country after country and made massive profits out of this pandemic. If ever there was a case for public ownership of the manufacture of pharmaceutical medicines, it is the COVID pandemic around the world. That is a, a case, surely, for public ownership of them. And it's also led to falling living standards and working class communities are considerably worse off as a result of it. And so we're now going through a renewed process of austerity being demanded by world, the world's financial institutions and being happily carried out by many countries around the world. At the same time, as there's more trillionaires than there's ever been, there's more billionaires than there's ever been, and there's more wealth being sucked into a small number of global corporations and super rich people than has ever been before. So on the back of the pandemic, when everyone else was scared and frightened about what was gonna to happen to them, some people were really coining the money in. And so I think the lessons for that are that we need socialism. We need that sharing of wealth and resources. We need those resources to be properly shared out. And we need an alternative, uh, an alternative economic system that brings that about. And that alternative is really what we have to put forward. You've experienced what the Troika did to you here in Greece. In other countries, it's called different things. But um, economic restructuring usually means bad news for the poorest people within our society. I was very impressed by the speech made yesterday by one of the uh, people that came on behalf of the water workers and their union in Greece. Well, you've still got publicly owned water. Well done. Keep it that way. In Britain, we had a prime minister once called Margaret Thatcher. You may have heard of her. <laughs> and she was a close friend of a president you may have heard of called Ronald Reagan. And they put forward this um, idea of Reaganomics, which was essentially you roll back the, the state, except for its um, military and policing functions, and you hand over all administration of all public services to the private sector. And water was amongst those that were, was privatized in Britain. So all those water systems that had been built up by usually labor municipalities over many years were, were sold off to the private sector, to water companies at a low price. They did two things. They sold off all the land assets they could as quickly as they could. They got rid of as many staff as they could and brought in contractors to do the work on their behalf and they made enormous profits. They've run the system so badly that in Britain, you've obviously all heard of Loch Ness, the place with the monster. It's the biggest, biggest lock in Scotland, the deepest and the biggest volume of water in the UK. The equivalent of Loch Ness is filled every year by water that is wasted because of the pipes are kept in such a bad condition and leak. And last year, there were 400,000 discharges of raw sewage into rivers in Britain because of the mismanagement by the water companies who also posted record profits at that time. So in Parliament this week, I said, the way to get clean rivers, the way to get clean water is to take it out of the hands of the profiteers and hand it into the hands of the public to run it democratically and accountably as it should be run. But the poverty that we have is also very serious. We now have in Britain more food banks than there are branches of McDonald's. So McDonald's is now second place in the supply chain of food to the food banks. And the people that are using food banks don't do it for fun. They do it out of desperation. They're not always homeless or always unemployed. They're people in work whose wages are insufficient to meet their demands, so they're having to access a food bank in order to survive. And so it is about what we do. 
Yes, we support food banks, of course. We support food cooperatives, of course we do. But we have to mobilize in the wage crisis that's there at the moment to demand a decent, reasonable, sensible minimum wage, not just in one country, but in all countries. And an end to the tax havens, tax evasion, and tax avoidance, which has cost us and the public services so badly in every country around the world. That is the kind of economic agenda and economic justice that we have to bring about. And it's a big battle. It's a big battle to get that message across because, as Eche was pointing out, the fundamental message of the right is always it's individual, you can do it on your own, you can always, get, you can always manage it on your own, but it might mean you've got to exploit somebody else. You've got to take the ladder away that you've climbed up to make sure nobody comes up behind you. Well, that's not very human and a not very decent way of doing things. And it does create massive levels of poverty, both within societies and at a global level. Look at the global gap between the richest and the poorest, as well as within our own countries. And so the alternatives have to be there. But our job is to build unity to do it. Socialism comes from a basic human instinct. The basic human instinct is that we are the keeper of the rest of our community. Community socialism is where a community comes together, often to try and defend maybe a hospital or a school that's closing or a service that's closing, but it can also be something that's demanding. Demanding clean air, demanding clean water, demanding better and bigger schools, demanding more teachers, demanding better health care, demanding good quality, high-paid, skilled jobs for our young people to move into when they finish their training and their university course or whatever they've taken forward. But it is about what we on the left can do to bring unity forward to achieve this. Like many of you here, I was not just devastated, I was very angry at the um, first round result in the French presidential election when Jean-Luc Mélenchon narrowly lost out to the fascist Le Pen. Why? Obviously because he didn't get as many votes as she did. Why didn't he? Because there was a split on the left in that campaign. Because the left were in several camps at the same time. We can't afford that luxury. We can't afford that luxury because we can't afford to have Le Pen being the voice of the French working class. And I'm delighted that there's been an agreement reached by all of the forces of the left in France now for when the assembly elections take place, there'll be united ticket fighting for all of those assembly positions and constituencies. It's our job, surely, to support them and support them in that campaign. And also take that lesson Take that lesson wider across Europe and across other places that, yes, we have differences, yes, we have debates, yes, we have the intensity of it, but let's not put ourselves into silos and refuse ever to listen to anybody else. The fundamentals that we have to put forward are peace, are humanity, are a change in the economic system and economic circumstances. And whilst we're often told, and I got a question about this this morning at the conference, well, uh, you lost an election, so-and-so lost an election, Yanis isn't uh, Prime Minister of Greece, and so on and so on, and you're not Prime Minister of Britain. I know that very well, she didn't need to tell me that. It's fine. Um, but it was sort of like a council of despair. And then I look around the world and I see something very different. I see something very, very different indeed. I see communities organizing, fighting back, and winning. The heroic and magnificent campaign of the Indian farmers defeated the market objectives of their government <laughs> to destroy their communities and their farming industry. The hope, and it is, sorry, Eche, hope is the word we can discuss. We'll, I'll see you later. Um, the hope that's there now in many parts of Latin America. I was in Chile for the inauguration of President Boric. And I met people there who I hadn't seen for years. They were people that had come out of Chile in 1973 
after the fascist coup, which killed Allende, 7,000 others, and drove thousands and thousands into exile. And I met these brave comrades that had come to Britain, that had gone to Sweden, gone to other countries, and done huge work in opposition, and then eventually were able to go back. And they told me how it felt to be able to see a real change in Chile, a real change brought about by process, protest and brought about by socialist ideas and that hope, brought about by the hope inspired by great musicians like Victor Hara or poets like Pablo Neruda. They brought about that sense of hope. And that sense of hope is there also in Bolivia where the government, yes, was defeated by lawfare and then they won the election. And we've got an election coming up in Colombia very soon. The election coming up in Colombia is going to be fascinating, important, because the idea that somebody of the left can become president of Colombia, unite the people of that country, that the wealth of Colombia can be shared amongst its people, not siphoned off by global big business to take it all away from the people of Colombia. And talking of people that have come back and fought back, Lula as president of Brazil and then placed in prison and then replaced by Dilma, who was then removed by another process of lawfare. And now the Workers' Party, with many other allies on the left, is fighting back. And we're all supporting Lula because we want to see that day when Lula is returned as president of Brazil, as an answer to those that offer nothing but depression and hope. And so this call for unity is something to me that is very, very important. Outside the hall here, when we come in, I think there's a wonderful exhibition there on the walls to the side, which is Global Voices for Julian Assange. And I was really pleased in the video that uh, Yanis put on earlier the message and the direct voice of Julian Assange. Julian Assange has told the truth about what the US was up to in Afghanistan, in Iraq, about Guantanamo Bay, and about their war planning, their gaming, and all the rest of it, and exposed the truth about so much. If he had been a journalist in Russia, who had maneuvered himself over to the United States and told the world all about all kinds of secrets in Russia, he'd be a hero. He'd get anything he wanted. He'd get a congressional medal. He'd get the lot. He'd get everything. But Julian Assange told the truth about the complicity of our countries in the behavior of the US and others around the world and revealed the truth. He took refuge in the embassy, the Ecuadorian embassy in London, and is now in a maximum security prison. A maximum security prison for somebody who hasn't been convicted of anything. And if the British Home Secretary decides to um, send him to the USA, then she will be consigning him to 175 years of imprisonment in a maximum security prison. Julian Assange actually speaks for all of us. He is our voice of humanity. So do everything you can to support Julian Assange to prevent that removal. And it's very interesting that the media around the world seem a bit nervous about getting too involved in the campaign about Julian Assange. I say this to all of our friends in the media. There but for the grace of God go all of you. He has told the truth about things. That is what investigative, real journalism is about. It's designed and should be to make life uncomfortable for people in office and people in power. I know that. That's right. That's what democracy is about, challenging people. Julian challenged, so they put him in prison. Release Julian Assange. <laughs> the last thing I want to say is about our relationship to our natural world. This might sound a bit wacky, and indeed, when I made these kind of remarks during the first leadership campaign I did for the Labour Party, a few people said, Jeremy, please, please, let's talk about bees and insects and flowers, please. I said, 
Nah, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Why? Because the climate and environmental crisis has got to be addressed in a holistic way. Yes, it is about um, carbon dioxide emissions, which have the greenhouse effect of increasing global temperatures. It's also the levels of pollution, which get into the upper atmosphere, and damage the air quality of all of us. It is also about the pollution of rivers and seas by plastic and chemical pollution. It is also about the destruction of the biodiversity of our lives because we are part of a global species. We rely actually for our very existence on the totality of the natural world and the natural environment. And when I went to COP25 uh, in um, Paris, I was actually quite encouraged. I was quite encouraged that all the countries of the world were there. I was quite encouraged by an awful lot that was said. And Naomi Klein and myself organized what we thought would be a small um, erudite seminar. We'd have a little chat with people. It was a bit difficult because there were 600 crammed into the room and about 500 more outside. But they were keen to hear a message and to be involved in things. And so it is about protecting and enhancing our biodiversity. COP26 in Glasgow was not a great success in the sense that the declarations were limited, there was an awful lot of greenwash, and there was a phenomenal amount of environmental lobbying, as Eche was pointing out, of people pretending to be suddenly very green. It's become a very big business to be green. But there was another COP going on. Our project, the Project for Peace and Justice, organized a week of alternative events in a theater, Webster's Theater in Glasgow. And people came there and came together. What was fascinating was the huge numbers of people that came to Glasgow in hope of a better, more sustainable world were also confronted by the refuse workers, the bin collectors, strike in Glasgow at the same time. So there were piles of rubbish all over Glasgow. They joined forces with the unions of the refuse workers, and the refuse workers joined forces with them, A, to demand decent pay and conditions, and B, proper and better recycling, reusing, and reduction of the waste that's there. There was a unity between the Glasgow working class who were working in those bins and the global environmental movement. It's that unity that will bring about real environmental justice. We're not gonna get the end to climate change without system change of a world based on profit and exploitation of natural resources rather than the protection and development of an, an economy that can run on a sustainable, in a sustainable way. I know it sounds a big ask and complicated, but it's not really. Because when I was confronted with these issues and I wanted to see how I could develop my party's policy on it, Rebecca Long-Bailey and myself had a long discussion about it. She is a member of parliament in Salford, just outside Manchester. And uh, she said, Jeremy, any policy we put forward has got to be something I can honestly go to the doorstep of anybody in my community and say, this policy's for you, wherever you work. If you're in a polluting industry or whatever you're doing, it is a green industrial revolution we need. You get that by public investment. You get that by advanced technology. You get that by um, giving people a real stake in a greener, more sustainable world. It can be done but it can't be done if we stick to the tired old free market economies of inequality, injustice, and, and built-in poverty to it. We are the green industrial revolution. That has to be the slogan of the left all over the world, because it's only the green industrial revolution that can save this planet. <laughs> Socialism is about living with nature, is about understanding each other, is about solidarity. But it's also recognizing where our rights have come from. You go through the whole wonderful broad stream of history and you see those heroic struggles. Who ended the slave trade? Who ended slavery around the world? I was taught in school it was done by a very nice man who was a, happened to be a Tory member of parliament in Britain, but he was a very nice man. And he introduced a bill 
to end slavery, and that was the end of it. It's absolute nonsense. It's total tosh. It's rubbish. What happened was the slaves who had survived the Middle Passage and got from Africa to the Caribbean and North America were in revolt, in constant revolt. And the slave uprisings in Jamaica, which was then the wealthiest sugar-producing place in the entire planet, rose up and burnt the sugar crops and burnt the houses of the slave owners. They were brutally repressed and killed in their thousands as a result of it. But they carried on because they were not prepared to live in slavery or see their children live in slavery. That had the economic effect of frightening the owners in Britain. So eventually, slavery and the slave trade was abolished. It was brought about by their actions. I want our history teaching to show that and our history teaching to show the global contribution that's made to so much that we have. How was the right to vote won? Was it ever given by the ruling class? Was it given by the royal families and the aristocracy? No, it was won by people. How did women get the right to vote? In Britain, it was the militancy of the suffragettes that did it. It was the self-organization of women that did it. It was Sylvia Pankhurst and working class women in the East End of London and other places that brought that about. It was the triumph and achievement of women themselves, just as was spoken earlier. It's women now who are standing up against the violence and misogyny against women in so many societies around the world. Socialism cannot exist without real equality and real equality of opportunity for everyone. And the, how was the uh, Civil Rights Act ever passed in the United States? Because the uh, derivation of slavery was awful, but the racism continued, the discrimination continued, the Jim Crow laws were there. The inbuilt discrimination against black people in the United States continued. But the marches from Selma to Alabama and all those people of the uprising against racism in the United States paid off and eventually they got the Civil Rights Act. It is about our power and our pressure. So socialism comes within our communities. And so let's stop just being defensive and start being determinative and demanding of decent health, of decent schools, of decent jobs, of a society that gives security for all that gives rights for all and protections for all. That means our work has to be education, our work has to be uh, campaigning, but it also has to be motivational to young people. Young people are growing up in a world where there's the greatest ever level of consumerism, there's the greatest ever level of choice, and there's apparently the greatest ever source of information. You've only got to reach for your mobile phone, I've left mine over there, but there you go. Um, and you can actually find out almost any fact anywhere. What you probably don't realize is there's an algorithm telling you what you want to find out. There's an algorithm that's following your thought process and tells you what, to, what you want to know. I mean, I turn on my phone and miraculously, within a second, comes up some news about Arsenal Football Club. Oh, I live near Arsenal, I support Arsenal, but it's not the only thing in my life. But the phone thinks it is, so it gives me this information whether I want it or not. Now, I can sort of bypass that and find something else. But take the technology and the genius of these algorithms a bit further, and then look at the success of Donald Trump, of Bolsonaro, of the right in Australia, and many others, and you begin to see how this extremely clever sophisticated technology can sell things, can buy things, can influence people, and can change minds, and can create racism, can create fear, can create danger for people. We need to have some thinking about the way in which the small number of very big companies control so much of what our media is about. We need to get that message out there and give hope to people. We need to build a a society that really is fit for the next generation. Because I'm frightened of young people growing up over-tested and stressed in too many of our schools in too many countries that are in debt because they have to go to college or university. Now going through a housing crisis where they pay more than ever for a rented flat and the insecurity 
that comes with that. And then being told that the public services they thought they were going to have in health and so on are going to be disappearing because they're all going to be privatized and they've got to make their way in a market economy. And those less able, those less achievable are not going to get any part of that. We've got to create a world of fairness and of justice. It's a big task. It's a big ask. Nobody ever did anything on their own. But it's the unity of people in all our campaigns, all our groups, all over the world. Understanding where we've come from, the better to know where we're going to go. Thank you very much indeed.